Um, I apologize to anybody who's heard me speak before, you know, because that's always a dicey thing, you know. Um, I was speaking at this uh, foster grandparents gathering, a uh, big, huge gathering. Well, I had spoken at it the summer before, and afterwards, this grandmother came up to me. I think she liked the talk. You know, her eyes were filled with tears, and she grabbed my hands, and she said, I heard you last year. It never gets better. <laughs> Am I delusional in thinking that maybe she misspoke there, you know? Um, Anyway, a keynote address is uh, it's different from a workshop. You're supposed to stay aerial view. It's supposed to be about the vision thing, as a president used to say. Um, it's about vision. It's about something brought you here and something brings you to your daily task. It's a vision of wanting the world to look differently than it currently looks, and good for you. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But my sense of you already is you're not the kind that want to just wait, you know, con los brazos cruzados, you know, and tapping your feet and staring at your watches. You want to make something happen. And what I want to suggest in the brief time I have with you is the highest aerial view in terms of community policing, it seems to me. It's about the health of a community. It's about creating a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we together uh, imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we together dismantle the barriers that exclude it's, as Barney said in the, in the film and others, it's about relationship and partnership. It's about mutuality. And how do we stand then uh, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, with those whose burdens are more than they can bear, with those whose dignity has been denied? All of us feel, I think, of that fortunate moment when you get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We're all called to that. That's our common invitation. Where there is no us and them, there's just us. That's the highest calibration of community policing, just us. How do we seek a compassion that can, in fact, stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? And I suspect that if kinship was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would be celebrating it. So for the last 25 years, I've worked with gang members. I feel like I don't know anything else. Um, I'm privileged to have uh, been sort of found myself uh, uh, having a vocation within a vocation within a vocation to work with gang members. They've taught me so much that's valuable uh, and I'm indebted to them. But in the last couple of years, they've taught me how to text and I'm so grateful to them. Uh, I don't know what we did before we were able to do this. I, I, it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people I'm finding. <laughs> and I'm pretty good, I'm pretty dexterous at it. Uh, LOL, OMG, BTW, you know, and. And there's a new one the homies taught me, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, no. <laughs> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. And so there I am in a, in a car with two homies, uh, Poncho and Manuel, and we're driving to Palm Desert to speak at a high school. And uh, they, they work for me, older vatos who've been to prison and tattooed and, and have changed their lives around. And so they're going to help me give this talk. So we meet at 9 as our office is open and we're driving to Palm Desert. And about 15 minutes into the trip, Manuel's in the front seat and, and all of a sudden, zzz, incoming, so he has a text. So he reads it and he kind of chuckles. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb, it's from Snoopy, back at the office. Well, Snoopy, um, I just saw him at nine o'clock. He gave me a big abrazo as the day began, as we started to leave. Snoopy and Manuel worked together in our clock-in room, which is a really hard job, you got a clock in uh, nearly 300 uh, employees, gang members, and so it's a, a tough job. 
And so I said, well, what's, it, what's he say? Oh, it's dumb. Hang on a second. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing, you know, and, and then suddenly I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that. And the word is kinship. The highest measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with each other. Kinship is a funny thing. You blink and you miss it and you don't want to. Um, the most palpable, keen sense of kinship I've ever experienced in my life was a handful of years ago when I uh, sort of had to battle cancer and got leukemia and went through chemotherapy and as the homies say all the time to me, I hear your cancer's in intermission. <laughs> it is, apparently it stepped out to the lobby to buy popcorn. <laughs> May the line be long, you know, so... Um, so I'm... You know, this news hit the front page of the Sunday LA Times, so word spread even among gang members, and, 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 uh, and homies and homegirls came out of the woodwork. I, I remember a homegirl named China. She left me a message at home. Now it's our turn to take care of you. Very sweet. Big, huge homie named Grumpy, six foot five, huge guy, standing in front of my desk. Apparently God had forgotten to give him a neck, you know, and he's standing there with big tears in his eyes, and he says, what do I have that you need? you know, meaning organs, you know. Um, I was really happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs, you know, but it was the thought that counted. And, um, and I remember once I, I, I would go to my chemo and I'd, uh, it would be like eight o'clock in the morning till like three in the afternoon at St. Vincent's Hospital and the homies always vied to drive me there and to pick me up. It was very uh, kind. And, and clearly the drive to the hospital and back was more harrowing than chemotherapy. <laughs> Um, so this one time I came back and I would rather be in my office than any place else. So I was sitting there and this little knucklehead gang member came in, a little 15 year old knucklehead and he came in and he, he had just gotten the news and he plunks himself down and he just looks positively stricken. I hear you have leukemia. I said, yeah, I do. And there was this awkward silence, you know, and my cat had leukemia. Yeah, she died. I said, oh gosh, I, uh, boy, sorry to hear that. Um, awfully glad you stopped by. It just picked me right up there. But my all-time favorite was a homie named uh, Loco who called me from jail, Collect, and, um, <laughs> and he had just read this on the, on the front page of the Sunday LA Times, and he said, hey, what's up with this leukemia anyway? I said, well, it's cancer, it's in the blood. The doctor says, my white count's too high. <laughs> Them doctors, they don't be knowing nothing. I'm sorry, what, what do you mean? Well, hello, of course your white count's high. <laughs> so I, I just decided to accept more collect calls and get more second opinions and, <laughs> and I don't know, I've decided to call it kinship. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and I remember once a reporter commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And he shrugged and he smiled and he said, the feeling's mutual. It's mutual. Sometimes, you know, we have this distance, this high moral distance, service provider, service recipient. We're even meant to bridge that distance and obliterate once and for all the illusion that we're separate. It's just us. That's what relationship means. That's what partnership means. That's what community policing means. It's mutual. That's the measure of a healthy community when you have mutuality. I remember once there was a homie named Caesar who uh, nobody uh, got more jobs through Homeboy Industries than this guy. I mean, he would uh, either in our, all our businesses or in the private sector. And over the years, I knew him as a kid growing up in the housing projects. And uh, 
But he would always sort of gravitate back to vague criminality or getting high mainly or selling drugs. Uh, but it was hard for him to kind of sustain this. Until one time he, he got out of uh, prison for a little stretch of a violation about four months and he came to see me and he was about 25 years old. A very smart kid uh, with a dangerous sense of humor and, and he sits himself down and he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different, he says. And I thought, well, all right. So I pick up the phone and I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and he hires Caesar right away. And two weeks later, Caesar's in my office and he's proudly waving his very first paycheck. And he says, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, gosh, who? And he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> no, 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 that's right, God. <laughs> and he said, you thought I was going to say you, didn't you? Said, oh, no, God, absolutely, number one. <clears throat> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now, he says. <laughs> well, suddenly kinship so quickly, we just died laughing. And I defy you to identify exactly who is the service provider and who is the service recipient. It's mutual. All of us are called in our way to become what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, calls enlightened witnesses people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused attent of love return people to themselves. That's the task of mutuality. It's never about holding the bar up and asking anybody to measure up, it's about showing up and perhaps holding the mirror up and telling people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth. It all happens to be the same truth. And here's the truth. You're exactly what God had in mind when God made you and you watch people, especially on the margins, people saddled with messages of shame and disgrace. You watch them become that truth. You watch them inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. And no four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. Homeboy Industries was born during the time I was privileged to be the pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission. It was nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. And together they comprised, at the time anyway, the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. What I didn't know, that it was also the location of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city, according to the LAPD. We had eight gangs in those two housing projects which is, I think, unheard of. I buried my very first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988, a young man named Rafael. And I buried my 176th this weekend, a young man named David. Not all of them from that community, of course, but I run a large gang intervention program, so I sadly get asked to do this. So myself and the community, we decided to do something. We started a school first because we had so many middle school age kids who had been given the boot from their home school, gang members, nobody wanted them. And they were wreaking havoc in, this, in the project, selling drugs and were quite violent. So I went to them, walked to them in the projects and I said, if, if I found you a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said yes. And then I, I couldn't find one. Um, so I had to start one, you know, it, it, it kind of forced my hand. And so that brought all these gang members to the church, which of course sort of upset the apple cart. You know, aren't churches after all supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in, bad people out. Well, that sort of tossed that idea out. And, and then they said, if only we had jobs. So um, that's when was born the, the, um, the nothing stops a bullet, like a job. I guess, because myself and the women mainly in the projects, we marched to all the factories that surrounded the projects in search of felony-friendly employers, you know, and that wasn't so forthcoming, you know, so um, 
so by 1992, we couldn't wait anymore. We had a lot of kind of projects and stuff, but we said, let's start our own business. So the uh, first thing we did was, was Homeboy Bakery, this old 80-year-old building across the street from the church. One month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Once we had plural, you know, we came up with the highfalutin Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture. And not everything worked, you know, this will be on my tombstone, anything worth trying is worth failing at. Um, homeboy plumbing was not a huge success, I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> Who knew people didn't want gang members in their homes? I, I <laughs> did not see that coming. And now we've just sort of backed our way into becoming quite unintentionally the largest gang intervention rehab and uh, re-entry program in the U.S. of A. Uh, 15,000 folks walk through our doors a year. Uh, and every single thing that we do has just come as a response to concrete needs expressed by gang members. Uh, we have tattoo removal, and we have a dedicated clinic, three laser machines, we have 27 volunteer doctors. Uh, they just broke a record in June, 681 laser treatments. No place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos uh, than we do when we always have a waiting list of 1,000 no matter how many uh, treatments we do. And it was all started because of a guy named Frank, uh, released two days out of Corcoran State Prison, and he's sitting in front of me uh, in my office, and pardon my French, but tattooed on his forehead, it said, F the world, like a billboard, you know, from here to here, to filled the whole space there. And he looked at me and he says, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, well, you know, Frank, maybe we could put our heads together on this one, you know, and so what could I do? I hired him, you know, and uh, I kept imagining, do you want fries with that? And no, oh, we don't want fries. And mothers clutching their kids, running out of McDonald's. So I hired him and he bagged bread for two years and, uh, and then I went and searched for a doctor and I found one who gave me one hour uh, every other month and little by little we chipped away in parentheses. I saw him not long ago, I hadn't seen him in a really long time. He's a, Frank is a security guard at a movie studio and there is no trace of the angriest message on his forehead left. All of us are a whole lot more than the dumbest thing we ever did. So you name it and we do it at Homeboy Industries. We have uh, every imaginable curricular thing from anger management to um, parenting to grief and loss, NAAA, GED, um, you name it, we have it. We have a huge mental health team, lots of case managers. Um, there are 1,100 gangs in LA County and 86,000 to perhaps 100,000 gang members. I don't think there's a zip code in the county that hasn't seen uh, members of uh, the gangs in that zip code who have wandered into our place. We are not a, a program that exists for those who need help, only for those who want it, in much the same that recovery works. No amount of me wanting that gang member to have a life is exactly the same as that gang member wanting to have one. They have to freely walk in, and once they do, it's ticker tape parade and red carpet. Um, we have all our businesses. Uh, Homeboy Diner just opened in the city hall, the only place you can get food in, L in the city hall building in LA. Uh, we're in 36 uh, farmer's markets where we sell our products. Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl uh, Merchandise, um, solar panel installation training program where we certify uh, gang members to uh, install solar panels. And Homegirl Cafe where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude will gladly take your order. Uh, and they cater. It's really quite the uh, gourmet place. Some months ago, uh, Oscar winning actress Diane Keaton showed up for lunch and she had uh, never been there before. And she came with a regular, a guy who's there, um, you know, once a week. And uh, her waitress this day is a young woman named Glinda, a homegirl, gang member, tattooed, been to prison, felon, parolee. She, she doesn't know who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattled off the three platillos that she particularly likes, and, and so Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one, you know, that one sounds good. And then something dawns on Glenda. She looks at Diane Keaton. She says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you. Like, you know, maybe we've met somewhere. 
and Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know, I suppose. I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> my God. That just took my breath away when I heard it. And, and suddenly kinship so quickly, exactly what God had in mind, if you may permit me a God moment. In fact, Jesus says it succinctly, that you may be one, that you may be one. That's the whole point of community policing. That's the whole point of a healthy community, a oneness, a unity. And we have to get this one right in terms of uh, gang violence because uh, our solutions in our treatment plan can only be as good as our diagnosis. If our diagnosis is bad, that's never neutral. It's always negative. I went to a doctor who I don't go to anymore and he said I had mono, so he treated me for a year with mono, a uh, mononucleosis, and, and, and I, I think we can agree that there's a difference between leukemia and mono. You want to get this diagnosis right. Nobody in this room has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. It has never happened in the history of kids. It has never happened in the history of gangs. Hopeful kids don't join gangs. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery. And who doesn't know by now that misery loves company? Kids are never seeking anything when they join a gang. They're always fleeing something. So a healthy community decides to address the thing the kid is fleeing. Long ago, and this is a sign of health across the country, we gave up the idea thinking that the problem with gang members is they're just not scared enough. We've come to know the truth now that the problem with gang members is they're just not hopeful enough. So there I was on the Dr. Phil show and trying to talk uh, Phil's producers from doing something stupid, you know, and we thought we had achieved it. And then, and there I am uh, being introduced by Dr. Phil and it's a live studio audience, so it's a taped show. And ladies and gentlemen, Father Greg Boyle, and I walk out there and he's sitting on his stool and my empty stool is right next to him. But on his side of the stage is a coffin and on my side of the stage is a perfectly reconstructed jail cell, bed, toilet, sink. And so he flies all these um, kids who have sort of gravitated perilously close to gang life and uh, with their moms who are beside themselves. And he, in effect, grabs them by the lapel figuratively and, and says, don't you see where this will lead? And I had to be the one to tell Dr. Phil that this kid, these kids know this better than you and I do. They know exactly that it'll lead to death or prison. They're not lacking information. They're lacking the pilot light of hope that will keep them uh, with an ability to steer their way clear of both things. They know where this will lead. They just don't care. And that's an important piece of information for us as we do an analysis. At Homeboy Industries, we always say we don't work with gangs, we work with gang members. And that was partly born of the fact that I used to work with gangs. Back in the days, I, don't, I always say, uh, uh, I don't regret that I did this, but I'd never do it again. Uh, I used to do all the shuttle diplomacy. I'd be on my bike in the middle of the night, put that Uzi down, are you sure you want to shoot this guy? I'd have meetings and ceasefires and truces, and, and I don't regret that I did it. it. The time sort of demanded it, but I know too much now to, to think it's a good idea. I can see now that it serves the cohesion of gangs. It, it provides oxygen to gangs, and that's a bad thing, it seems to me. And people will say, gosh, gangs will always be with us, so we might as well dot, dot, dot peace treaties, truces, ceasefires, whatever it is. And I always say to them, you don't speak for my community when you say that, because nobody in my community thinks that. I've lived in a hot zone for 25 years. I've lived there when it was the hottest zone. And nobody in my community wants gang to be part of the multiple choice for their kid, not even gang members. A, go to college. B, learn a trade. C, Join a gang. 
No. Nah. You ask anybody in my community to close their eyes and to imagine the community they want for their kid, even ask gang members, and have them imagine it for a good long time, and then ask them to open their eyes, and then ask them this question, were there gangs there? And no one will say yes. And no one will say yes, but they're getting along. No. They'll say no, even the gang member will say that. And that's an important part of our strategy is to align our hearts and will with the hearts and will of the people. I always uh, talk about anchoring ourselves in the two refusals. Refuse to demonize a single gang member and refuse to romanticize a single gang. We don't allow uh, romancing at Homeboy Industries. It's, it's uh, like in recovery, romancing the drink. You know, remember that time, when, God, we got so wasted and you were wearing the lampshade, how'd we get home? That's romancing the drink instead of saying, yeah, my wife left me and I lost my job and my kids hate me. Well, that's the truth. We don't allow gang members to romance the drink, if you will. We want them to come to terms with the truth of what this has meant. Real death, real grief that lasts forever. And so part of what we have to imagine is the mutuality of uh, kinship, where everybody is included and everybody feels the dignity and the worth, their soul feeling their worth. There was a homie who um, most resisted all my offers of help. Um, everybody called him Bandit, and he was well-named. And uh, I would ride my bike in the projects in the middle of the night, and I'd see this character run up to cars and sell crack cocaine, and he'd walk away counting his money and then he'd see me, and I wish I could say he was embarrassed, but he wasn't so much. And I'd say something like, how about a real job? And he was always very polite. Well, that's okay, G, thanks, though. Until one day, 15 years ago, Bandit shows up in my office, and I couldn't believe he was there. And I said, yes, y milagro, that you're here for the very first time ever. He said what gang members often say, too. I'm tired of being tired. So I walk him to one of our four job developers, and as luck would have it, they find an entry-level, unskilled, a low-pay job, a first kind of job in a warehouse. Now cut to today, Bandit is uh, el mero chingon of the whole warehouse. He's the supervisor of all the supervisors. He's own, he owns his own home. He's married. He has three kids. Well, I hadn't heard from him in, in about uh, two years, and no news is good news usually from gang members, but he called me one Friday afternoon, a little bit breathless and panicky. Gee, you got to bless my daughter. ¿Qué pasó, mijo? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine, my oldest, my Jessica. She's going to college. But she's a little chaparita, and we're afraid for her, and that's really far. That's way up north. And she's moving away. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she leaves. And I said, sure. And I said, look, I have a baptism at one. Why don't you guys come at 1230 tomorrow and, and we'll do a little send off. And they all show up at 1230, Bandit and his wife and the three kids, including tiny little Jessica, heading to college. And I say, you know, well, let's, let's put Jessica in front of the altar. And let's encircle her with our bodies and our love. Everybody touch her, connect to her, grab her arms and put your hands on her shoulder and on her head even. And I tell them to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And as the homies say, I do a long prayer. I go on and on. And, <laughs> and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I notice that we've all become chiones. You know, we're so oh, oh, oh. And I don't know why we're crying. We're all crying. Except for the fact that Bandit and his wife do not know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody in their families. So we finished the prayer and I wipe my eyes and we're all laughing and bagging on each other for how mushy we got. And then I, to change the subject, I look at Jessica. So what are you gonna study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. I go, forensic psychology? <laughs> and Bandit chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and Jessica, very deadpan, looks at her father and does one of these, you know. And he sees her and he laughs. He says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. 
So we walk up to the car and big abrazos, everybody says goodbye and they pile in the car, but Bandit hangs back. And uh, I'm glad he has. I look at him and I said, hey, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes fill up with tears and he says, Sabes que? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bona para nada, good for nothing. I guess I showed him. I said, Yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. There's an idea that's taken root in the world. It is at the root of all that's wrong with it. And the idea is this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. We stand against that idea in a commitment to mutuality and to the power of community. Because community will trump gang every time. One last story. A question I'm always asked is about enemies working side by side with each other. And it's a dicey thing. A homie will come in and say, I'm ready. And I said, well, okay, I've got an opening for you at the bakery, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z. And I rattle off the names of enemies from rival gangs. And they always say the exact same thing. They wait, they think, and then they say, well, I'll work with them. I'm not going to talk to them which used to bother me in the old days until you discover, of course, that it's impossible for human beings to demonize people they know. You can't sustain it. So this one time I had, ho had a homie named uh, Youngster and, uh, from this one gang, and he seemed to be ready to me. So I walk him to our homeboy silkscreen factory, our biggest business, been around for 17 years and million dollar business, really quite successful, that one. And uh, I'm introducing him to his 30 coworkers and he's shaking hands to every single one, including enemies, looking them in the eye. And I thought, boy, this is great. Until youngster gets around the bend and he encounters a homeboy named Puppet. And when the two of them are in each other's vicinity, they mumble something. They stare at their shoes. They will not shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies because I know what gangs they hail from. But he just finished shaking hands with other enemies. I discover later that this is a hatred that the two of them do not think they can get past. I sense that much at the moment. So I look at them and I say, hey, if you guys can't hang working together, you let me know. I got a bunch of people who would love this job. And they say nothing. Six months later, uh, Puppet is going to kind of a corner store. And, uh, but on his way home, he decides for some reason to take a shortcut. He finds himself in an alley and quite unexpectedly, he is surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one. And they beat him badly, and he falls to the ground. And while he's lying there, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds him and takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so you can get a flat read for two days, doctors sign the certificate. This allowed family and friends to gather. I was at St. Louis University giving a talk. I flew home. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life. Nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. Horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. And at the end of the 48-hour period, as a priest, I gave him la unción de los enfermos. I anointed him, said a blessing prayer. They disconnected, and I buried him a week later. But in the first 24 hours, I'm in my office alone. It's 8.30 at night, and the phone rings, and it's youngster, Puppet's co-worker at the silk screen. And he says, hey, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything we can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it. And then finally he breaks the silence, choking back his tears. 
and he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy, he was my friend. We work together. Now, can I say that always happens? Yes. Any exceptions? No. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own deepest longing for us, that we may be one, just happens to be our own deepest yearning for ourselves. It's mutual. The movement of health in a community towards mutuality, towards a compassion that's larger and more spacious than we've known, that will always be the measure of our health in every community in which we live. It's mutual. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. Thank you all very much.